Hey guys, what's going on? In our last podcast, we discussed an article about Bloody Sunday and the subsequent Seville inquiry. Back with you today is... Kylie, Kirsty, Ashlyn, and Garrett. And in this episode, we'll be addressing the results of the Seville inquiry and answering the major questions we posed in our first podcast. So now we'll recap what exactly happened on Bloody Sunday. The incident took place on Sunday, January 30th, 1972, in the Bogside neighborhood in Derry, which consisted mainly of working-class nationalists. At this time, a group was gathered to protest the British policy of internment without trial involving the crimes of the Provisional Irish Republican Army, known as the PIRA. During the protests, shots broke out from the British Army, and 26 Catholic men, women, and teenagers were shot. 14 people died as a result. While the soldiers claimed that they were acting in defense and that the crowd was armed, the people were outraged and called Bloody Sunday an act of murder of the innocent. In our previous discussion of Bloody Sunday, we really didn't go into depth about the British investigation of the incident. The British called these investigations the Seville Inquiry. The Seville Inquiry was an investigation of Bloody Sunday commissioned by the British government in 1998, which was headed by Lord Seville of Newdigate. The investigators spent years examining the, ev- the evidence about the event, and eventually the final civil inquiry was released to the public in 2010. Our main source of reference for this event was Nevin T. Aiken's article, The Bloody Sunday Inquiry, Transitional Justice and Post-Conflict Re- Reconciliation in Northern Ireland. Aiken says that the British Prime Minister David Cameron released a statement that affirmed the inquiry's main findings regarding negligence and misconduct by members of the first para and the innocence of civilian victims who were killed and wounded, noting that what happened on Bloody Sunday was both unjustified and unjustifiable. It was wrong. Even though the findings of the civil inquiry turned out favorable for the Bloody Sunday victims, many Irish people were not pleased with the investigation as a whole. The families of the victims seemed to have mixed opinions of the chairman of the investigation himself, Lord Seville of Newdigate. Eamon McCann's book, The Bloody Sunday Inquiry, The Family Speak Out, contains primary accounts of the inquiry from families of the victims. In one interview, Geraldine Doherty, niece of one of the Bloody Sunday victims, Gerald Donaghy, said, The first time I saw Seville in the Guildhall chamber, I thought he was just ordinary, like ourselves. I did feel a bit iffy on him as well, but I thought, well, maybe he'll just give justice to the families, and we'll just have to wait and see. Sometimes since then, I've thought, nah, he's not for the families. Other times, I've thought that he is. He was very well-mannered, I'll say that for him. Many Irish people think that the civil inquiry will never be able to erase the wrongs done to the victims of Bloody Sunday. And the British can apologize, but the Irish cannot forget the injustices they faced. In our first podcast, I asked a question about the murals found on the exteriors of buildings in Derry. I wanted to know how the Irish used these murals to express their views on Bloody Sunday. I will discuss how the Bogside artist used murals to commemorate the events of Bloody Sunday and inspired the Irish to seek justice for the wrongs that were done to them. One of the most famous dairy murals is the so-called Free Dairy Corner, which is a painting on a wall with the slogan that reads, You are now entering Free Dairy. This mural was originally painted in 1969 in protest to the British military occupation of dairy. This Free Dairy Corner has become a historical landmark to remind people of dairy's fight for freedom. Most of the other murals in Derry depict images of the Irish victims of the Bloody Sunday Massacre. The main source that I used for my research is Trauma, Place, and the Politics of Memory, Bloody Sunday, Derry, 1972-2004 by Graham Dawson. And in this article, Dawson gives a beautiful description of these Bloody Sunday paintings. He says, Seen from the ground, the murals have a strikingly dramatic impact. They install at the heart of the location vivid images of the events of the past that took place here, creating a kind of living art installation that weaves memory into the scene of everyday life. And I think this quote really shows that these murals represent Ireland's collective memory of Bloody Sunday. The Irish are trying to move forward and heal while also never forgetting the trauma that happened to them in the past. 
people can come to the bog side and look at these murals and remember all the tragic events that happened in Derry. But these paintings are not just a way to commemorate the past though. They also serve as a way to remind the Irish of the injustices that they have faced and also feel proud of how hard their ancestors fought for freedom. The people of Derry are anything but weak and the murals really serve as a way to represent their strength. So one of the questions that I wanted to get answered uh, was about my grandfather and his involvement in the IRA. And basically, I uh, just talked to my family members. Uh, my dad is one of 12, and that's the side that comes from Northern Ireland. And I just wanted to learn more, like specifically, like I knew that like, you know, my family is not sympathetic towards Protestants, which are uh, people of English descent living in Northern Ireland. Uh, my family is Catholic. And uh, I wanted to just learn like why my grandfather was a part of this uh, group even because I know for a fact that you know they're sometimes considered terrorists they bomb London they do other bad things but I wanted to know and uh, I found out that my grandfather was a captain in the IRA and this was signaled by he had these little blue tattoos stars on his hand between his pointer finger and his thumb in like that web area and there's two of them and apparently it was just like the rankings but uh how he got his rank and his I guess you can say uh, high up position somewhat in the IRA is uh, he was a smuggler. Since he was right on the border of Northern Ireland, he would smuggle people into Northern Ireland uh, from his uh, house. Basically, since my dad is one of 12, they had a large house and they had space to smuggle people and keep them in there. And I just thought that was really interesting that he was in the IRA and doing a little bit more research I found out that my great grandfather also was in the IRA and he was such a, like a die hard uh Catholic that he wouldn't even watch British TV or listen to British radio and that's pretty interesting uh in my opinion because um you know it's pretty crazy to think about how you can be so close to another country or even just a borderline and just have such resent and must have been difficult to go about day-to-day -day life but they did it, and uh, I thought that was interesting. But uh, uh, in my other research, uh, I found out that Northern Ireland is a part of the UK and has all these uh, English descendants, uh, Protestants, because England was really broke at a time, and they couldn't pay off of uh, they they couldn't pay their military commanders or their lords and stuff like that. So. They were like, hey, if you move to Ireland, you can get a decent amount of land and you can keep it. And that's what happened. They moved to Northern Ireland and they took that land. And that's how it became a part of uh, Northern Ireland and uh, as part of the UK. And I thought that was really interesting. I didn't know that, even though I'm from there and have, I, I feel like I know a decent amount about it, but I, I don't know that kind of those little tiny uh, quirks. So uh, I thought that was really interesting to learn and you know, a piece of me is a little conflicted because my grandfather is a part of the IRA or was, he's now passed, but, uh, oh, and when he died, uh, I was at his funeral and three vans rolled up, uh, white unmarked vans and guys got out in ski masks and shot like blanks, like a, a gun salute like they do for the military for, uh, high up officers when they pass away. I thought that was really crazy i was not expecting that i flew to ireland uh flew back there to go say goodbye basically and all that crazy stuff happened my other family members were i think i think they knew it was happening but it's definitely interesting for me uh especially not having any you know prior background in that kind of stuff happening but i uh, i just really thought it was interesting learning more about ireland and my roots and my history and a piece of me like i said is a little conflicted because they have done some bad things but also you know, a piece of it also makes me very proud to be Irish and Northern, Ir Northern Irish to be more specific. But uh, I guess hopefully one day that they can figure out their problems with each other and, you know, stop having this little like square off uh, and people getting hurt or whatever. But for the most part it has, but for the most, you know, it can be worse, it can be better. But, you know, it was interesting learning about this and I guess I'll pass it off to the next person here to talk about. my first podcast, I said that I wanted to learn more about the history of the walls that encircle Derry. 
I will discuss both the origin and the modern significance of the walls. An article about this topic, which I found to be useful in discussing the importance of dairy and the walls themselves, is called Dairy's Walls and was written by Andrew Sanders and Ian S. Wood. Sanders introduces the article by saying, While Belfast might have been the most important city, politically and militarily, and the South Armagh borderlands might have been the most treacherous deployment for a British soldier, the second city of Northern Ireland, variously called Derry or London Derry, arguably defined the Troubles. It was a prime target for Unionist gerrymandering after partition. It was central to the civil rights campaigns of the late 1960s. It was the site of the Battle of the Bogside, which prompted the initial deployment of British troops to the streets of Northern Ireland. It was the location for the Civil Rights March of January 30th, 1972, which resulted in Bloody Sunday. It was the focal point of the Operation Motorman Raids of that July, and it was the it was in Derry where the IRA campaign became the wind down well in advance for the 1994 ceasefire. This quote, which supports the fact that Derry is a prime example of the tensions between Britain and Ireland, mainly due to all of the significant events that have happened there. As for the walls themselves, Sanders suggests that they symbolize the political battle between the Catholics and the Protestants, which roots back to the beginning of the 17th century. According to Oliver Creighton in Contested Townscapes, the walled city is world heritage. The need for the wall began in 1689 during the Great Siege. Lasting for 105 days, the siege was one of the longest European sieges in history, according to Chris Arthur in Under Siege, and was between the Catholic King, King James II and the Protestant people. Overall, the walls have borne witness to religious feuds for centuries, from the time they were built to the events of Bloody Sunday. Even today, the walls encircled Derry as a reminder of the ongoing tension between Britain and Ireland. The question about Londonderry that I wanted to answer was, how does the division between Protestants and Catholics affect the entirety of the city? The feud between the Protestants and the Catholics goes as far back as the Siege of Derry in 1689, when the Protestant supporters of William III held out against the mostly Catholic supporters of James II in the city of Derry for almost 105 days. This stronghold eventually became a symbol of the Protestant religion, and an icon to Protestants everywhere. The long parade of issues between the Protestants and Catholics really took hold in 1922, when Northern Ireland became its own separate state. The Protestants held the majority of the city in both population and government positions, and the Catholics, although also a majority, were forced to reside to the Bogside. The Bogside is famous for being the part of the city under the walls, in the overcrowded suburban area of Derry. Catholics were living in poor conditions, and many were faced with unemployment and food scarcity. The large population of Catholics felt underrepresented and oppressed, which caused violent backlash from the Bogside residents. The city of Londonderry was set up from its beginnings to face a long and tumultuous period of events that has been dubbed the Troubles. The Troubles was an ongoing period compiled from different civil movements, both peaceful and violent, like Bloody Sunday as we have previously mentioned, and it is clear that the rift between the Protestants and Catholics has never been resolved, even to this day. This riff is a product of the overall division between the British and the Irish, with the city of Derry being a prime example of all these feuds combined. It was interesting to research about because the underdog Irish always seemed to be coming from behind, like with their homes being in the overcrowded bog side and having disadvantages in the job market and in political positions, which speaks to their history as a colony of Britain and their placement in the United Kingdom. This division is even mentioned in pop culture, like in one of my favorite Ed Sheeran songs titled Nancy Mulligan on his most recent album. The song follows the journey of Ed's grandparents, William and Nancy, who fall in love despite living in Ireland on the opposing religious sides. Ed writes about how her father disapproved of their marriage, and Ed writes in the first person from his grandfather's point of view, saying, From a farm boy born near Belfast town, I never worried about the king and crown, because I found my heart upon the southern ground, there's no difference, I assure you. His lyrics, his lyrics clearly touch upon the division between his Irish Catholic roots and Nancy's Protestant roots in the South. It is incredibly interesting that this division in Derry is still referenced in pop culture, and that this song has become such a popular hit. I feel like this riff of religion has become a staple part of life in Ireland, and will continue to be a major part of Derry's history. So that about wraps it up for today. Uh, thank you for tuning in to our podcast, Dairy Then and Now. Um, 
I just really enjoyed working on this and, you know, talking to my dad about uh, Ireland and his family and all that kind of stuff, it made me feel like uh, I was back at home, uh, miss it genuinely, but I did learn a lot about my family and their ties with the IRA, which I thought was very interesting. And, uh, you know, it's always fun to learn new things about your family that you may not have known before. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to Kylie. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting to learn about dairy because, like, who would have known that? a city like this could have such a rich histor historical significance to it. And this is not history that I would normally learn, so being able to research dairy was really different from what I normally expect from a history class. Yeah, and I liked going into like the depth um, of the different religions in dairy. Kind of shows like not only the, the division between the British and the Irish, but like the Protestants and Catholics overall too. So yeah, I think we all enjoyed this experience and we all got to learn something new. So thank you guys for coming on this journey with us and listening to our podcast. And that is it.